Um, to begin with, a little bit of introduction about me. Uh, so you don't have to sit there wondering. The accent comes from Australia, originally. Um, when I first got involved in politics, uh, one of the things that makes me quite unusual in terms of involvement in politics, and for anyone who doesn't know, I was the leader of the Green Party from 2012 to 2016. But when I was first elected as leader, and you know the media went looking for stories as they do, and they found that my first degree was agricultural science. Now it's actually unusual to have people from a scientific background in politics, which I think is a huge pity. And if you're here and you're a scientist, think about getting involved in politics or talk some of your friends into it. Uh, but one of the things when you put the agricultural science degree together with the background from Australia, um, the media got very excited about the fact that I was probably the only British political leader who knew how to shear a sheep. <laughs> Which probably tells you more about the media than it does about me, actually. Uh, but this is, as I was saying, when you probably couldn't hear, uh, this is the second Skeptics in the Pub event I've done on Universal Basic Income. The previous one I did uh, it was in Coventry. Uh, and I have a feeling that Skeptics in the Pub events are usually held in pretty good pubs. And this clearly is a good pub, looking at their beer list. Although I think Coventry did have one over you because it was actually a microbrewery. And so they actually had a whole lot of vats of, vats of the microbrewery along one wall. And I was talking to the vats and you know, seeing what the yeast thought about it all. Uh, so that was Coventry. Um, and it wasn't sort of like this. this. I had to say I walked in here and thought, oh dear. My comedy routine is a bit scratchy. <laughs> I did actually work out a stand-up comedy routine once when I had a very long car trip across France. Uh, and it was actually a comedy routine about hedgehogs. And as I recollect, it actually started by asking the question of is, how do hedgehogs give birth? Okay. To which the answer is very carefully. <laughs> but actually, it's really interesting, and this is where my science interests come in, because actually the babies are born sl swollen with fluid and that covers the spines over. So there's, there's your little interesting scientific fact, random scientific fact of the evening. But what I'm actually here to talk about is universal basic income. Now, this is a subject that the Green Party, I was gonna say championing, but it's not quite true. It has been Green Party policy for 40 years, virtually ever since the Green Party started. But I have to confess that we haven't always talked about it very much because if you have a policy and no one else is talking about it and you're just the people, the one lot of people out there championing it, it's really hard to get traction. But something has really changed in the last, even the last three or four years. And actually, everybody is talking about universal basic income, or so it seems. It's an idea whose time has really come. So for anyone who's come along just to say, you know, find out what's this all about, in short, universal, this means it's an income that goes to everybody in society. In the Green Party, we used to talk about citizens' income, but I'm afraid in the age of UKIP, I feel like these days we need to talk about universal basic income because the idea is that it goes to everybody who's accepted as a member of this society. And that, of course, will include many people who aren't citizens. Although not, you know, someone who arrived for a two-week holiday, you know, uh, on the plane last week, obviously. So it's universal, and it's a basic income. Now that basic is something that maybe we'll be talking about and we'll have some discussion about. But I interpret that as meaning it's something that meets your basics, your basic needs. Food, clothing, shelter, your universal basic income is money that you get every week and it covers your basic needs. Now the aspect of the universal means that it's not means tested. And I was just having a nice chat at the bar about how terrible means tested benefits are and all the things that are wrong with them and maybe that's something we can have a discussion about. But basically, it's you exist, you're here in this society, you get paid the income. Now, uh, one of the great things about that is it means the administration costs of a benefit like that are really low. Child benefit, which in some ways, until it was recently mucked around with by the uh, government, was a universal benefit, and it was simply paid to every child, and it costs about 1% of the total cost of the benefit to administer. So that's 
one of the advantages of universal benefits is they're really cheap to administer. So, I get this quite a lot, particularly on right-wing television shows, which I'm afraid largely includes the BBC. Uh, you're going to give people money to do nothing. No. What we're going to do is say that we accept that you as a member of a society are going to contribute and, crucially, that you as a member of this society are not going to be left with no money at all. And that's one of the reasons why I think in the past few years the idea of universal basic income has really very much taken off. Because actually until maybe 10 years or so ago, the idea that any significant group of people would be left with no money at all was something that perhaps in the 1970s with the dishonourable exception of single mums whom there was a particular prejudice against. Basically, there was a dec decent wage and if we think back to historically what it was like, people didn't talk about a living wage. They talked about a family wage. And the idea was that people, mostly men, would have a secure job that would pay enough to support a wife and a couple of kids. And an ordinary job, even like being a postman, would actually support people enough to, to buy a house. But what we have now, of course, is something very different. We have a minimum wage, and do not let anyone call it the living wage. It is George Osborne's fake living wage. And lots of people are on zero hours contracts in insecure employment, and they can very easily be left with no money at all. And of course, we have hideous, swinging benefit sanctions. That means people very often, through no fault of their own, could be left with no money at all. So the first thing that universal basic income fundamentally delivers it delivers security. It means nobody is left penniless. I've often been quoted as saying that we shouldn't rest until the last food bank closes because of lack of demand. And universal basic income, set at the right level, should ensure that the last food bank closes due to lack of demand. So there's security, and that's kind of the negative argument for universal basic income. But there's also, I believe, a really powerful, strong, positive argument for universal basic income. Because what we want is for people to be able to contribute their skills, their talents, their abilities to society in the best way they possibly can. So, you know, I will confess that it's possible in a universal basic income society, indeed it's likely in a universal basic income society, that there'll be a lot of bad poetry written. <laughs> Lots of people will decide it's just their vocation in life to sit and think deeply and write poetry. But there's a couple of good things about that, as well as the bad poetry. One is that you could get some absolutely wonderful poetry written that isn't written now. And also, Bad poetry has a really low carbon footprint. You don't even have to print it. So it's a very environmentally friendly way to spend your time writing bad poetry. But perhaps slightly more seriously, one of the things that people who are arguing the case against a universal basic income will often say is, but how will we get the people to do the really horrible jobs in society? Now, the case study I pulled up one day talking about this was sewer cleaning. So, of course, by the nature of public meetings, someone immediately put their hand up and said, well, my mate's a sewer cleaner and he loves his job. <laughs> but nonetheless, let's take sewer cleaning as an example that perhaps most of us don't really fancy as a job. And maybe, yes, it's true that in the universal basic income society, you might have to pay sewer cleaners more than you pay bankers. Maybe you should pay sewer cleaners more than you pay bankers. That's fine. And maybe you would find 
you know, there's a lot of what uh, an author called called Graeber has called bullshit jobs in our society. Um, you know, those really horrible call centres where you have to answer every call in 48 seconds and your time when you go to the loo. Maybe no one would go and work in those call centres at all. And maybe all of our lives would be much, much nicer as a result. And I say that particularly as someone who spent an inordinate amount of time in the past few weeks trying to sort my electricity bill out. So I, I do I get, feel particularly passionate about call centres at the moment. But what we have is a society where people, instead of being forced to do jobs they hate, being forced, as a job seeker's allowance does now, to get people applying for soul-destroying after soul-destroying day, week, month for scores, hundreds of jobs that they know they're not going to get. But because to get the job seeker's allowance, you have to jump through those hoops. People can actually work out how they can contribute to society and make that choice to contribute in the best way they can. So if you want to be an artist, you've perhaps trained at university, you want to see if you can make it, you can live on a universal basic income. Yeah, it is basic, it's not meant to be a luxury, but you can see if you can really make it in your art. If you want to start a small business, and let's say you're someone perhaps with a couple of kids now, you need to support a house, keep them fed, it's really tough to start, start a small business now. The insecurity stops lots of people doing it and keeps awake a lot of people who are doing it now. With a universal basic income, you can do that with the basic security behind you. So there's that. And then one of the other benefits of a universal basic income is you take away all of the benefit traps. At the moment, it's really hard if you're on job seekers allowance and say a friend offers you a few hours work down the market on a Saturday. If you declare that, if you're absolutely 100% honest, you can get stuck in enormous traps of having lost your benefits. It takes weeks and weeks to get them back. And you know, you'll be down the, down the payday lender before you know it, desperately trying to get some money to survive until maybe your benefits come back. So a universal basic income, you earn that money and then you just earn whatever you earn on top of it. And those earnings are taxed, but the UBI is there as a basic payment. Now, one of the things about the way this works, and this is something else that uh, right-wing media tend to very much play with, is, you know, but it's going to millionaires too. Well, yes, it's a universal benefit, but you get them back off them in tax. So it doesn't actually mean that make them any richer, I promise. So if you want to look at the actual details of this, uh, in 2015, in the election manifesto when I was leader, we put out a working paper that put our own proposals for, forward for, for universal basic income. And that was 80 pounds a week. And basically anyone on more than about the median wage, I think it was around about 24,000 pounds a year then, um, didn't end up any better off. So it wasn't a subsidy to the rich. It was simply something you kept it administratively really simple. And you know, one of the things that I sometimes say to Tories, it's really low cost to administer. You don't need many civil servants at all to administer it. So there's all of that. And then there's the question of why is it that it's the Green Party that for 40 years has been the champion of universal basic income? And it started out, and there's a lovely man called Clive Lord who's been the champion in uh, the Green Party for 40 years of universal basic income. Uh, he is one of those people who, whenever you ask him any question at all, what's the solution to this? His answer is, citizen's income. <laughs> and I am very cautious of any idea of anything as a panacea. And I don't think citizen's income is a panacea for all of our ills. But nonetheless, what it does mean, if you give people that security, is they feel much less the desire to scramble to get more and more which is how so many people feel now. We're insecure, we're uncertain about the future. So if you get that bigger house, that's your pension. Because who really trusts the financial sector? Even if you have a pension, who knows how it might turn out. People feel like, you know, I've got to get ahead at work because, you know, when the next round of redundancies come, 
Who knows where I might end up if I'm not seen as one of those go-ahead people who's scrambling up the ladder. So one of the things that I'm always very keen to talk about is, you know, when I'm talking about individual about environmental issues, it's not individual behaviour I'm concerned about. You know, I'd, ra I'd rather that you didn't fly to Dubai for a long weekend. I will admit it. But nonetheless, I understand why people do, because you're supposed to, if you're a thrusting, go-ahead person in certain kinds of business, you're supposed to have a good water cooler conversation, an exciting conversation. If you're not going ahead, you're falling behind. And behind that is a feeling that if you start to slide down the ladder, our steeply unequal society, who knows where you're going to end up? Where will you fall? So what universal basic income does is it puts a cushion at the bottom that everyone can feel safe and secure. And in that circumstance, some of that push for more stuff, bigger houses, fancier clothes, fancier holidays, all of that push doesn't have the same impetus that it has now. So, how do you pay for it? The next big question. Well, I'm not going to stand up here and recite a whole lot of numbers at you because, hey, we're in a pub. Apologies to the mathematicians, but they're more fun things to do than that. But as a kind of shorthand, um, our policy in 2015, about half of the money came from replacing existing benefits. So, and from the savings, because it's far cheaper to administer a universal basic income than it is to actually um, you know, make someone fill in a 42 page form and prove they've applied for 40 jobs in the past week, even though they, know they won't get any of them. Uh, so, about half of it comes from there, and half of it comes from basically taxing people earning more than £44,000 a year and taxing multinational companies. Which is where we get to the sort of broader challenge that is often made to universal basic income, where people say, oh, but you know, this is a big change and you're just being unrealistic. You're being unrealistic about making big multinational companies pay their taxes. Well, my answer to that is simple, that I think it's profoundly unrealistic to think we can continue with the state of our society today, economically, socially, environmentally, politically, we have to see big changes. We will see big changes. And those changes will be moving in a positive direction or sliding in some potentially very negative directions indeed. And so we have to present people with a positive prospect of a future where they're secure, where they're not worried about the fate of themselves, their kids, and their grandkids. And one of the things that I think is a measure of how much the general public really gets in their, in their gut, if not yet in their head, how much we've got to change, is a study that's been going for decades, asking people, do you think your kids and grandkids will have a better life than you've had? And that's results of that study are increasingly massively negative. People get that what we're doing now isn't working and we need to change. And I would say that universal basic income isn't a panacea, but it's an important step towards that. And the interesting thing is, I'm not alone in that, because the other obvious question is, well, so has anyone tried this out? And interestingly, back in one of the, in probably the last time the world was in a kind of economic crisis, a social crisis like it is now back in the 1970s, Canada, in Manitoba, they actually ran a trial of universal basic income. The interesting thing is the results, and those of you among you who are perhaps academic or scientists will probably be fairly horrified by this. The results were only published a few years ago because a right-wing government took over from a left-wing government and locked up all the records and refused to let them out. Which probably gives you a bit of an indication that it actually came out quite well, the results of this study. And one of the interesting things is, you know, one of the things that drives mainstream economists crazy is it's really hard to model how people will behave in a universal basic income society. But what happened from this case study, and of course remember we're talking about Canada in the 1970s, so it is socially, culturally somewhat different to the world today, 
but basically there were only two groups of people who reduced the amount of time that they worked. One of them was mothers with young children. And I think most people would probably say that's not really a terrible thing. And the other, and remember the time we're talking about, was young men who didn't go out to work but stayed in education instead. And I would say that that's a very good outcome. And you know, we might, in a different gender age, might say you know, young people staying in education longer is a very good thing. So that's one of the early case studies. There's also another slightly morally troubling but interesting example, which is from the Cherokee in America. And it's not, wasn't called a basic income, but actually a group of the Cherokee decided on their reservation to set up a casino. And they decided to make a per capita payment to everyone from the tribe from that casino. So the source of the money is <clears throat> ever so slightly troubling, I'll confess, but we'll, we'll park that one. Uh, but someone was doing a study on this and they suddenly realised several years down the track they were doing a study on universal basic income without really realising it. And it was, the person who was doing this study was particularly interested in mental health and well-being, and particularly in mental health and well-being of children. And what happened, and this was a sliding scale, basically they got some of the money, they invested some of it and paid some of it to people, so each year the payment goes up. After four years, what they found was there was among the poorest groups in the tribe, there was a 40% reduction in mental ill health in children. By a decade later, they couldn't distinguish between the mental ill health from the group of the poorest from the wealthiest in the tribe. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, common sense has a bad name, generally speaking, in the social sciences and in sciences, but, you know, if parents aren't stressed and worried, if people aren't living in poverty, they'll have mental, better mental health. It's not really that surprising, I don't think. If people have that security, they're much better off. Which, of course, brings me to another example, a book that many of you may know, an excellent book, if you don't, called The Spirit Level, which actually shows how more unequal societies are actually worse off the wealthiest as well as the poorest. So if we created a society with security, maybe even the, the wealthiest would be better off as well. So that's kind of the history of universal basic income. What's happening now, excitingly, is there's a whole lot going on around the world. I was actually before Christmas in Finland where they're running a trial. Like many of these trials, it's not quite, it's not really at all universal basic income, but it's something like it because they've taken 2,000 long-term unemployed and they're giving them a basic income for two years. Now, of course, this is not really a fair trial because two years is a pretty short period in your life you're selecting the people who are already long-term unemployed anyway. And there are no results yet out of this trial, but there's certainly some anecdotal stories. I do rather like the story about the man who actually is, is trying to set up a small business, but there's so many international journalists coming to talk to him about the universal basic income trial that he hasn't got time to set up his small business. Uh, but um, there's some good stories coming out of it. Scotland is planning to run a trial. Utrecht, the uh, Dutch city, is running a trial. And I think that's, you know, it's a really positive sign. And one of the interesting things is about Finland, um, I do have to possibly um, boast a little here and that the Finnish Greens are currently running second in the national polls in Finland. And they have had some influence on that. And before someone asked me, why aren't the Greens here doing as well as they are in Finland? Well, you know, they do have a democracy and a fair voting system in, in Finland. And for those, for those of you who can see it down the front, I'm wearing a Make Votes Matter uh, pin because making Britain a democracy is something else I could very easily come to talk to you about because it's something I'm very passionate about. And, you know, as an aside, uh, if you want to ask why did we get the dreadful Brexit result that we got two years ago, first past the post voting system that's left people feeling desperate to take back control is a certainly a large part 
of that. And actually, I think we could say if we want to take back control, taking back control with the universal basic income is quite good as well. I quite like that slogan, take back control, turn round and use for different purposes. Okay. Um, so, but Finland, uh, it was actually a right-wing government that brought in this trial. And they actually brought it in and brought it in for the long-term unemployed because they wanted to elim eliminate benefit traps. So it's an interesting case study. Which actually brings me to a really interesting question that I was asked in Coventry. Because in Coventry, when we were getting towards the end of the Q&A session, someone asked one of the most beautifully constructed questions I have ever heard. You know, and I say that as someone who's, you know, spent possibly more time than I've enjoyed on the Today program with John Humphreys. <laughs> Come to think of it, that's a really bad example of well-constructed questions. But anyway, um, uh, a really well-constructed question in Coventry. Uh, someone said, we're called sceptics, but everyone here has just been a cheerleader for universal basic income. Uh, so the question was asked of me, you know, could I say something bad about universal basic income? Which I thought was a very good question. It was very, very well structured. Uh, but I can actually, because one of the things to, it's important to know about universal basic income is that there are actually right-wing people who support the idea of a universal basic income, or often they talk about a negative income tax. And I've once or twice, very occasionally, been on some platforms with some really people with whom I feel really uncomfortable agreeing, like the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, and if you set the universal basic income too low, it can become a wage subsidy. So it's just a subsidy for corporate profits. So it means people can live or survive on lower wages than they would be able to otherwise. And indeed, I would argue that that's basically what most of the Blair and Brown uh, Labour governments did during the period where they allowed the value of the minimum income to slide while actually list lifting family tax credits and housing benefit. And that, so when you're talking about universal in basic income, I'd really urge you to talk about it, setting it at a level that does meet people's basic needs. And people said to us, and I think it's, a reasonable challenge in 2015 when we set it at 80 pounds a week. Isn't that too low? 80. 80. Um, we were fighting an election. We were setting out a fully costed manifesto. That was where we could get to a reasonable level at that point in time. What was key to what we had to do in 2015 as the Green Party was we kept housing benefit going, which in a pure universal basic income society, it should cover housing costs as well. But because it's that problem in, um, you have in politics, and uh, particularly in British politics, where you want to say, we don't want to start from where we are now. You know, housing is so messed up in Britain that we couldn't find a way that not starting from there, when you look at the cost of housing in places like Cambridge, in places like London, that you can't set a universal benefit at a sensible level for across the whole country without acknowledging the impact of housing costs. So, one of the things that I guess, you know, I've talked about the principle of universal basic income, I've talked about the trials. Maybe, we can't do that perfectly. And certainly I don't think we can click our fingers and say, you know, we'll get elected as the Green government in the next election. Who knows when the next election might be? It does keep me awake at night, although not very often because I do need to sleep sometime. But do it in six months time. Well, we've all seen what Ian Duncan Smith has done, the mess of universal credit introducing massive changes suddenly without trials without pilots is not going to work with the complications that that that's got so you know our green party proposal is that in a second term of a green government will bring in the universal basic income now i know there's at least one or two members in the audience who are thinking i've missed something out here because one of the reasons why they're here and why lots of people are now talking about universal basic income is because there's a question about how much work there's going to be or how much paid work 
is going to be in future with the rise of automation, the rise of artificial intelligence. Now, I think we've got to be a little bit careful about lots of this. Way back in ancient history in 2000, I actually wrote a, a master's thesis on artificial intelligence. And actually, way back then, there were people who were saying, in a few years' time, it will all take over everything. And we're now 18 years on, and they're still saying, in a few years' time, it's going to take over everything. But there is certainly a risk, and certainly a restructuring of our economy that's going on. And I think it's important, first of all, to ask ourselves questions about whether we want things to be automated. And, you know, let's take a really simple, easy example that probably almost everyone in this room has an has a experience of. Those lovely self-service tills. No unexpected item in the bagging area. <laughs> Uh, personally, I refuse to use them unless I'm absolutely desperate. But, um, you know, we do have to ask a question of whether we want to use them, not just because they're really annoying, but also because isn't there something slightly, slightly odd, you might say, about a society in which we've just appointed a minister for loneliness, in which we also have a situation where the one encounter that many people might have in a day with a real human being they can talk to is being taken away. So we don't know what's happening with automation. But it does raise a bigger, a broader philosophical point, something that universal basic income raises and I think to some degree addresses. And tonight I've probably used the term work as most people use the term work, by meaning paid work, mostly. But you know, we have a problem is how much paid work exists in our society. And people say with automation, will there be enough work? Well, I would argue that if we think about work as things that need to be done, things that should be done, things that could make all of our lives better, there will never be any shortage of work. And this is one of the reasons why UBI is very much potentially a very feminist policy because a lot of that work now in our society is done by women. That's just the practical reality. Caring work, community work, voluntary work. You know, I haven't caught up with Cambridge, but you know, in Sheffield where I live, you know, lots of the libraries are now run by volunteers and there's a distinct gender balance in those volunteers. There's so much that needs doing even going and having a cup of tea with a lonely neighbour down the road. That's something that could really improve our lives, improve our society. So when we think about universal basic income, we're saying that you are a member of this society. We're not going to check up on you. We're going to expect you to contribute in whatever way you can and whatever way best suits you. We're starting to look towards a society of all of the talents, a society that values everybody. Now, I very much believe that dialogue is much better than monologue. So I'm going to stop then and say to you that, you know, one final thought before I go, which is the fact that you're here this evening shows that you are thinking about the way the world is now, thinking about how it might change. But don't just think about it. I'd urge you to do something about it. I've got a saying which is that politics should be something you do, not have done to you. Now by politics, I don't necessarily mean even just voting, party politics, elections, standing for elections, although I always want to encourage people to do that. But Politics is getting together with your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues, people with like-minded interests and trying to improve your world. And that's something that I think we all desperately need to do. We've had politics being done to us for decades. We've had 40 years of neoliberalism, neo-Thatcherism, a whole society structure that really hasn't worked out. It's time for a change. 
I think that universal basic income should be part of that change. But much more than that, I think we need a society in which everyone is involved in building that change. So please join me in doing that. Thank you.